welcome everybody um, to this evening's event. Uh, we're going to, to run a, a, a three-part um, Bible talk series um, and the, the heading, as you've seen probably from our advertising, is on discovering the Bible. Uh, we actually ran um, several of these during lockdown online and it was under the heading of what the Bible really says about and then we've had a topic uh, for each, each um, session. So we've got three sessions coming up. Uh, we've got um, today's, which is covering um, suffering. Then we have life after death, and we have a hope for the future. So my name is Lawrence Davenport. Um, I am a Christadelphian. I've been studying scripture now for more years than I um, remember. Um, and I meet here in this hall um, to worship and to, and to praise um, God. And what we're going to do uh, is we're going to spend um, probably about 50 minutes or so this evening in a discussion with um, my co-host here, uh, Mark Whitaker, who uh, is going to um, answer some questions on this topic of suffering. Now, you don't have to be alive very long before you experience suffering of some kind. It's, a, it's part of our human experience, something that we will have all have um, experienced. You know, you just have to look in the news and there is examples of suffering uh, that, that we find uh, within, within the news every single day. And sometimes people look at that, and I've heard it myself in discussions with uh, people when I um, say that I, I follow uh, Jesus and I read my Bible, that they don't believe in a God because of this problem of suffering, the problem that evil exists in the world and that humans suffer. Now, how could there be a God that allows this level of, of suffering in the world? Um, and we're aware, Mark and I are obviously both aware that this is a very sensitive topic uh, and there'll be people in this hall which are suffering um, in ways that we don't understand and um, don't want to pry into, but these things are being experienced uh, with us. So we'll, we'll deal with the, the topic with sensitivity um, and with care. But what we're going to do is we're going to focus um, on what the Bible has to say um, about this, this, this topic. And we find, you know, spoiler alert, but we find that there is comfort that we find from Scripture. There is a hope that is found um, in Scripture. But also the Scriptures talk to us about pain now not being taken away from us as a result of, um, as, of our lives today uh, following scripture, but um, it offers a hope for the future. So that's the, the shape of what we're going to be um, discussing um, today. Um, philosophers and people with many more brain cells than I have have been considering this uh, for many years, many centuries. Um, I'm not sure whether you ever heard of a Greek philosopher who was called Epicurus, who was around in about um, 341 um, BC, and uh, he was struggling with this problem of how can God or gods exist? He was living obviously in Greek culture at the time, um, and the problem that he was, he was putting forward was, um, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then from whence comes evil? And so we have this problem of evil which has been um, troubling people uh, for many centuries. Again, a bit closer to home now, um, in the 20th century, we have C.S. Lewis, who wrote many things actually on, on, on Christianity. And there's a quote here that I have. He was also um, um, working on this, this, this topic of human suffering. The problem of human and reconciling human suffering with the existence of a God who loves is only insoluble so long as we attach a trivial meaning to the word love and look on things as if men were the, the centre of them. Man is not the centre. God does not exist for man's sake. And so... He comes to these conclusions about it being that perspective that we have, um, which is not being man-centred. Anyway, we're here to look at this topic from the perspective of, of the Bible. 
and um, and we're going to to um, break it down into a number of, of, of questions that I will hand over to Mark and he will ably answer them uh, for us. So Mark, we've invited you here to, to talk about this, uh, this subject and, and have this conversation. Um, maybe it's a bit helpful you know, to introduce yourself and maybe your perspective on suffering um, in your life. Okay, uh, it's, well I'm, I'm suffering a cold at the moment. Um, <laughs> And in, in many ways, I feel a little bit of a fraud on this because my, my life isn't a life that's been, that's been sort of uh, traumatised by suffering no more than, than uh, for many normal people. You know, cuts, bruises, breaks, the things that most people would go through uh, in life. So I can't say, well, I bring to you, you know, particular trauma experience. Um, I've had people very close to me who've, who've gone through significant suffering that I've... I've been with them for. Um, both my parents uh, went through uh, terminal cancer together um, and that was, that was quite a, a trying time seeing them going through quite a significant amount of suffering mm -hmm. um, and not being able to, to do anything physically mm. um, to, to relieve that for them. And uh, my older sister uh, for 20 years endured MS um, which, which you know, led to her dying eventually and that was, that was a significant amount of suffering as well. So there's been there's been suffering uh, around me in the family, but um, for me, really, the what's helped me to to um, cope with seeing that um, has been my faith in in what the Bible has to say, um, to understand from what the Bible teaches that there that there is there is reason for this, that it's not just a set of random events uh, that are taking place. But that, uh, but there is purpose behind the, the suffering that, that either myself or others have, have been through. It's, it's, it's the Bible that I would always go to, to try and get that, that bigger perspective on what's going on in, in my own life or the lives of, of, of those around. And that's because the, the, the Bible has plenty to say about suffering and it, and it gives us um, literally hundreds of, of examples of men and women who've been through suffering and in many cases were given some ideas to why they've been through those things mm. and, and we've been able to see how they've dealt with it and how they've related to God through that suffering. Yeah, and that, that's um, you know, one that springs out very obviously is, is this entire book about Job um, who, if you look at the things that he endured, they were significant from you know, um, illness and, and, and loss, uh, pain and suffering himself personally. So. So um, that, that's a particular character and a book that we can, we can look at. Um, so what would you say then, and maybe focusing in on, on Job, what would you say that we can draw out of that example that we, we, we find? I think, uh, I think Job's a, a really interesting character because the, when, when you open your, your Bible at the book of Job, which I'm, I'm going to try and do just like that, um, the, the very first thing we're told about Job in the Bible, in the very first verse of the book of Job, is that, is that this man is blameless and upright, a man who feared God and shunned evil. So Job is introduced to you and me as a good man. In fact, he's not just a good man, he's a really godly man. Um, and yet, Job suffers absolutely terribly. Um, he goes through far more suffering than, than perhaps any of us ever will in our lives. And, and the, the thing that's picked up about Job is that when he, when he does undergo such suffering he doesn't he doesn't turn against god he, he remains a god fearing man i'm just looking at the end of job chapter 1 uh, verse 20 it says then job arose tore his robe and shaved his head and he fell to the ground and worshiped and he said naked i came from my mother's womb and naked shall i return there the lord gave and the lord has taken away blessed be the name of the lord in all this job did not sin nor charge god with wrong and even in the, in the next chapter when, when, when uh, Job is provoked by his own wife, when, when his health is taken away, um, in, in chapter 2 and verse 9, you, you, you get the same sort of response from Job. Um, verse 9 says, his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. 
And, it, and it's really clear, actually, from those early verses in Job, that even, even though Job, Job didn't know what was going on and why these things were happening to him, that one of the, the things he did appreciate was that suffering is it, it's part of the, the human condition. It's part of, 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 of life. Um, he, and even for someone as godly as Job, he, he knew that that was, that was something that he was, he was going to uh, end up going through, that, that suffering in life was, was inevitable. And, it, and it's interesting, actually, because it's not just there. It's, it's borne out in comments that come out through the book. So, so later on, one of his friends, Eliphaz, says, Yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. And, uh, and Eliphaz is, is, is right. That's one of the things he says that is true. Um, and, and Job himself uh, kind of repeats that later on when he says, man who is born of woman, which is all of us, of course, is a few days and full of, of trouble. So, so although, the, although Job might have puzzled with his friends as to why he was suffering, of course, that's why you've got the whole book, just trying to answer that question, you know, why, why is the suffering? Whilst they were puzzling that, the one thing that Job absolutely accepted was that suffering was a, a, a part of life, that you couldn't, uh, you, you couldn't get away from it. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's really interesting that obviously you've got somebody like Job who is called out as being a faithful individual, yeah. and he himself says it happens to everybody. This, this, is, this is part of, of the human experience. And that goes somewhat against maybe the ideas that we, we have uh, that percolate through culture sometimes around karma and about you know good things will happen to you if you do good things and and actually that was some of the messages wasn't it of of the friends which yeah, was yeah. you know if you do bad things bad things will happen and therefore you must have been being bad um, and so that that idea is is um, almost put to bed a little bit by by Job so maybe let's you know Job is a very early book if you look at the dating of Job it's mm. a really really early yeah. book um, and uh, maybe um, look at where does the origins of this, where does this suffering start? Where do we find this in scripture uh, being introduced to us? Okay. Well, um, Lawrence, you've got to go right back to the beginning of the Bible because, uh, because the origin is, is virtually as soon as you open your Bible when we're, when we're looking at suffering. And it, and it starts uh, really just after creation. You see, at the end of, of uh, Genesis and, and the very first chapter, you... You read in the last verse of chapter 1 that God saw everything that he'd made and indeed it was very good. And, that, and that the, of the very good things that God had made, um, man and woman were, were the pinnacle of it. Um, Genesis 1 and verse 26 uh, records that God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Um, and, and of course, that, that's still the case today, isn't it? That, that God gave mankind dominion um, over, over all creation. And, and one of the things that you, you pick up there in reading about the creation of man and woman is, is, that, is that humankind is very different from, from every, everything else that God made. Mm -hmm. um, that, that everything else God made was very good, but, but man... And woman made in God's image have have a completely different uh, level of intellect to, to everything that's in in the animal kingdom. You know, we have we have free will as human beings. We have we have a sense of morality that, that an animal that doesn't have. We we have uh, we have creativity, the the ability to actually think and create things. And if you think. You know, that really means that we're made in the image of God because he is the, he's the, the, the ultimate creator. You know, there's, these are things that, that animals don't have that, that you and I possess. Um, you know, and that's what God wanted when God made man and woman like that. He, he wanted a, a world where humankind would be there in his character, mm. in, you know, yeah. living in, in his image, um, using the free will he'd given them to, to reflect what, what he was like. And, and when we go on in Genesis, you see that, that God makes, he makes only one request of, of the man and the woman. And it comes in chapter 2 in Genesis, when, when he puts the, the man into the Garden of Eden, uh, in chapter 2, verse 16. It says, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, 
but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So there's only, only one law there provided by, by God for, for the man and the woman. And God states the consequence for them of, of disobedience. He says, if you, you, you disobey me, then, then you will die. And of course, we only have to go over into the next chapter to find that that's exactly what, what Adam and Eve choose to do. That in, in, in chapter 3, having been tempted by the serpent, verse 6, we read that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And, and the thing is that God was absolutely true to his word. God, God had said to them, if, if you eat of this tree that I've, I've commanded you not to, then, then you'll die. And that's, that's what happens, that, that they become now dying creatures. And part of that process of being a dying creature is that they will now experience suffering. That's part and parcel of it. Um, and you see that actually in, in what God says to them. If you go further down chapter 3 to verse 16, uh, it says that to the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are. And to dust you shall return. And, and you can see there, can't you, in, in the, what God brings upon the man and the woman that suffering is now going to be part and parcel of their lives. Life, life will be difficult rather than easy. It will, in, it will involve hard work and toil and sweat and pain and suffering. And ultimately, God says it will lead to, to death and them returning to the ground. And that, you know, so simply in the first few chapters of the Bible, that's, that's the origin of suffering that leads to death that's, uh, that's brought to our attention. It was Adam and Eve's choice to disobey God, to, to not live in the image of God uh, that brought about suffering in the first place. Yeah, that's a really clear um, line drawn, isn't there, between the events that happened in the Garden of Eden, the, the, the events of, of, of Adam and Eve, and this problem of evil, the, 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 the suffering. So um, the question is, um, Mark, um, are you uh, suggesting then that um, as a result of these things in the Garden of Eden, all those years ago, we now suffer today because of that. Is that what you're suggesting? I, I am, yes. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to deny that. Um, and, and the reason for that is because, is because that, that nature, which was part of the curse that God brought upon uh, Adam and Eve there, that, that is, is, is something that we inherit from them. Um, as our ancestors, you know, in the, in the same way that you could say, well, I've got my father's ears and, uh, and, and my mother's uh, teeth. Um, you know, I've inherited that from them, um, that, that we've inherited this, this nature uh, from, from Adam and Eve. And it's come all the way down through every generation. In fact, Genesis sort of lays out each generation after them and says these people lived and they died. And it's almost emphasising that they, they've got the same nature as, as Adam and Eve have, have, have now been, been cursed with uh, by God. It's a, it's a, it's a corrupting nature, bit, and, and it's corrupting in two ways. It's, it's, it's corrupting morally, because there's, there's this tendency to, to sin, to want to disobey God, and that's come through every generation, and every single man and woman that's lived since Adam and Eve, and, and it's corrupting physically as well. It's a, it's a nature that's subject to, to suffering and ultimately... Um, to, to death as well. There's, a, there's, there's actually a much better way of putting it than this, uh, which is words of the Apostle Paul, where in talking about sin and its consequences, when he writes to the Romans, um, he just says in, in Romans chapter 5, he says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. You know, it's a... Uh, it's, 
it's it's a, a fatal genetic disease you, you might say that has just been handed down then from from one generation to the next yeah so um, and that that then poses um, a different set of questions that we might be might be asked ar around um, the the reason why we inherit this and how it's linked with with sin so you've clearly shown that there's a link in the Old and the New Testament to the events that happened in the Garden of Eden and that um, th the sin that we have and therefore suffering so thank you for, for describing that but what what if um, uh, what about the innocent newborn child like the 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 child that has never sinned mm -hmm. and what about also the example that we provide in we have pro provided in the Bible of Jesus so um, you read it about Jesus and it expressly says that he didn't sin. Mm. But, you know, he was it, I mean, the narrative explains the suffering he goes through. So maybe just, you know, square that circle for us. Yeah. And I, I, I guess for most people, actually, this is maybe one of the most challenging aspects of, of suffering and, and maybe death uh, as the ultimate mm -hmm. end to suffering, uh, the most difficult one to, to actually reconcile. And, and I... For me, it's, it's really important to appreciate that, that from that point when, when the man and the woman sinned, their, their natures were changed. And, and it wasn't just, um, it, well, it was, it was both this, this physical and moral change that, mm. that's taken place, that, that they are, they're, they're corrupting in both ways. And, you, and you, can't, you can't sort of split the two apart. That, that you've got both both moral corruption that's going on in this tendency to sin and you've got physical corruption going on. So so for the for the innocent baby that dies, it's even though it's not had an opportunity yet to express its its moral corruption by sinning against God, it it still has that mortality. I mean we call it mortality, don't we? It still has mortality. It still has the whole package which includes physical corruptibility which in, in, in tragic situations may mean that a child dies um, even before it's, it's reached an age of, of understanding. And, and you, can, you can actually look at the, the Lord Jesus in exactly the same way. You know, Jesus had, he had exactly the same nature. He had a nature that was, that was physically corrupting, you know, from the moment of conception he was, he was going to be someone who would live and die mm. because that's the nature we bear. And, and, and a, a nature that was going to be, going to be fighting against God, but, but which he fought with every, every day of his life. And unlike all the rest of us, the Lord Jesus, through his whole life, overcame that. He overcame that side of his, his nature. But, um, but because, of, because the two, you know, that, that's, that's our whole nature, had Jesus never, ever sinned, he would have still become an old man and, and, mm. and died one day because, because it's part of the whole, the whole package. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and I guess, um, you know, you can see that in, in the life of the Lord Jesus, that, that although he, he never sinned, um, it didn't stop him from, from being hungry or, or being thirsty or, or being hurt. It didn't stop him from being wounded when, when they beat him and when they crucified him. It didn't stop him bleeding. Um, and, and it didn't stop him dying because it's all part of, of, of the one mortal human nature is, is both physical and, and, and moral corruption. You know, and, and you can extend that further, can't you, and say that you know, that's true for, for us all. We, we, we don't all just uh, die um, because, because we, we share mortal human nature. We also all go through, mm. through suffering yeah. to, uh, to differing degrees as well. And... Um, maybe it's important to say that people, and this, this goes back in a way to your karma point mm. from before, people don't suffer more because they happen to have been particularly bad, nor do they suffer less uh, because they've, they've been less bad. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it is all part of our nature and what we go through. Just a, a couple of verses maybe to, to, to pick up on, on that. Um, in, in Luke's Gospel... Uh, people come to Jesus to talk about f folks that they considered to be innocent who had died um, and asking actually were they really bad people in, in, in reality. This is Luke chapter 13 um, and there's two examples given. 
Um, just one of them, Luke 13 and verse 4, Jesus says to his followers, those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse sinners than all of the men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You know, there was, they weren't worse because they suffered terribly in that way and, and yeah. lost their lives early on. And actually, the, the opposite is, is, is true as well, that back in, uh, back in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, one of the things that Jesus points out is that God makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. Mm. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So it's not just that suffering comes to all of us because we all bear the same nature, but actually God's goodness is shown to, to everyone regardless of how good or how bad we are. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long... Yeah, no, that's, that that's good. And, you know, staying in the Sermon on the Mount, it's interesting that there's this section at the beginning called the Beatitudes... And a, a big chunk of that is actually blessing people who are suffering in some way. Yeah. So blessing yeah. are those that mourn, yeah. those that are poor in yeah. spirit, etc. So there's there is a um, there's a there's a acceptation um, in the gospel that human suffering is part of the experience of being being a human, and actually that can be um, uncomfortable sometimes to think about, and um, as a as a Christian to come to an understanding of. How do, you, how do you accept a God who's merciful and loving um, with the fact that this, this suffering exists? So maybe we can tackle that. Um, mm. So how do, we, how do we have the balancing act of a God who it professes in Scripture is loving and merciful and that this suffering exists? Even his son, like even God's son, suffered. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, a good question. I guess... Um, I guess I'd have two, two points about this, really, Lawrence. Um, and the, the first one is this, that when, when men and women say, and I've, I've had this said to me plenty of times, you know, you know how, a, God, a God who's loving should not be allowing people to suffer. How, you know, how can there be a God if he allows all this suffering? That what, what they're asking, maybe without realising it, is they're asking God to, to be unjust. They're actually saying to God... Um, God, I want you to be, to be inconsistent uh, because, because I, I, what I want you to do is to may, maybe you look at one situation going on in the world and say, you know, I'm going to allow that suffering to go on. That's fine. Uh, but I'm going to uh, look at some other suffering that you happen to have picked up on. Um, and I'm going to say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to allow that. I'm going to somehow intervene and prevent that, that suffering. You know, and that's... Um, what, what has to be appreciated and what you see more and more as you read the Bible is, is that God isn't just loving and merciful. Um, God, God is also just and God is faithful. That, that means that, um, that God does what he says, that God is reliable, that, that God is absolutely uh, trustworthy. And if you, if, you, if you say to God, well, I, you know, I'd, I'd rather you were inconsistent. I'd, I'd rather you, you totally played fast and loose with those characteristics that you've stated you have. Mm -hmm. then, then, then really we are, we're completely undoing God's character. You know, and if you, if you, un, if you undo um, the character of a God who says, I'm, I'm just and I'm faithful and I'm trustworthy. You know, what are, what are you? Well, you're, you're not left with God. You're left with somebody that's much more like a, mm -hmm. um, a human being. You know, that's, that's, that's what we do if, if, we, if we demand that God, God sort of steps in, you know, where, where we see fit to, to remove suffering because it goes against the, the character of God that we see. That's, that's one point, um, yeah. um, Lawrence. But I think the, the, the second point I'd make is, is goes right back to what we read in Genesis, which is why I probably made a bit of a big deal of it back then, mm -hmm. uh, which is, <laughs> which is that, 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 of course, God created the man and the woman with with free will and Adam and Eve chose to to disobey God um, and that resulted for them in suffering and it, and that is so often still the case uh, with with you and me today you know men and women today and um, we're all like this we uh, we will choose to do what God has said is is wrong or what he may have certainly said is unwise for us to do in life and uh, and that may well bring suffering might bring suffering on us it might bring suffering, and very often does, um, on other people. And I think actually, if you were to look around the world and think of some of the 
you know, just think of the news tonight and some of the worst cases of suffering that we are aware of in the world at the moment, they're, they're being inflicted, aren't they? That suffering is being inflicted by men and women on other men and women mm. through, through the, the exercise of the free will that, that God has, has given to us. Um, and actually, there's, there's, um, there, there are uh, parts of the Bible that sort of make it clear to us that, that, that yeah, we, we are actually the, maybe the biggest bringers of, uh, of suffering through our, our use of free will. And it can go both ways, that mm. we, can either, we can either bring suffering or we can, or we can prevent it um, in, in many cases. I'll just uh, read a couple of verses to you. If you want to look up these, I, I find these quite... Um, quite telling, and they're in the book of Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 29, so it always helps to tell you where I'm going, and just try and, try and look at these couple of verses in the, in the context of the world you and I live in today, Proverbs 29 and verse 7, the righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. You know, and the writer there is saying, you know, the, the person who's a God-fearing person, they're, go, they're, going to, they're going to take note of the poor and do something to help them. The wicked, they don't care. They're happy to let the, the suffering go on. You know, that's, that's true, as true now as it was then. Verse 8, next verse. Scoffers set a city aflame, but wise men turn away wrath. You know, there's any number of cases of that going on in the world at the moment, aren't there? You know, it's, there's, there's two different kinds of people. We can, we can either bring suffering about or we can, or we can work to, uh, to uh, prevent it. You know, the, many of the roads that lead to suffering actually um, sit in our own hands. That, that we, we are, because we've been given free will by God, we can choose to bring, to be, to be part of the problem, or, or we can even choose to be part of, a, of the solution in a small way. In, uh, in people's lives and there's, uh, there's, there's actually Proverbs itself is full of examples of ways in which we bring suffering on ourselves or not yeah. by our exercise of free will or we bring suffering on other people or we don't yeah. through our, our exercise of, of free will so our, our, it's our free will which can, which can be the source um, of suffering or the avoidance of it and, and we have to ask the question well what do we want God to do you know if, if suffering in so many instances, sits in the hands of man and woman, yeah. if it's us that's doing it, when somebody says God shouldn't allow suffering, what are we asking God to do? Are we saying to God, God, I want you to remove free will from men and women. Uh, and, you know, in, in whatever way it is, I want you to stop that bad person doing that bad thing. What, what's God going to have to do to that person to make them not do a bad thing? You know, or, e or even, you know, I, I, you can expand this out really widely, you know, um, uh, poor people in, I don't know, in, in Turkey who, who uh, uh, had that terrible earthquake earlier this year, you know, thousands of people suffered, died, um, and people say, why, you know, why did God allow this suffering? What, what was it that people were wanting God to have done to have, to have somehow affected people's minds so that nobody lived in the earthquake zone? Did they want people, uh, God to have suspended the laws of nature in some way so that, so that the tectonic plates in the earth wouldn't do what they need to do? You know, there's a, mm. there's a demand on God that, that I think is not massively thought through to say, I, God, I want you to stop suffering by, by what? Making, making man and woman no longer have free will, M making us in, into robots. And, and actually, you could argue that a loving God a God who wants us to, to love him out of choice is not a God who would, who would then arbitrarily just take our free will away and, and, and do, do away with it. Yeah, and that brings us back to that quote from C.S. Lewis, which is about what is love, what is the love of God. And having a very, very trivial kind of superficial view of that love may lead to those yeah. kind of thoughts. But it is, you know, it's uncomfortable um, to, to think about, um, you know, the implications of that. And the, you know the reconciliation of that, but let's let's leave that there for a moment, and let's maybe shift our attention to maybe some of the more positive aspects of of uh, the topic um, uh, this evening. 
Because there's in the in scripture there is a number of examples where suffering has some kind of positive effect on the believer. So this human experience that was introduced at the beginning of our Bible um, has some has some way of developing character, has a way of developing <coughs> faith, and actually we see that in the Old and in in uh, the New Testament. So maybe you could just. Um, talk through some examples of where that um, that comes through. Okay, and there's there are there's there's countless um, number of examples of this, but I just want to take you to a small handful if I can. Um, and the first one is is in the book of Deuteronomy, and it's uh, and chapter eight. It's where the people of Israel have spent forty years wandering through the wilderness, and and they'd suffered times of of hunger and thirst, um, and and Moses has this comment to make to them. Uh, at the end of their journey in, in Deuteronomy chapter 8. At verse 2 he says, You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And the, the point that, that Moses uh, seems to be making there to the people of Israel is, look, God, God very deliberately um, put you through hunger and feeding you with manna so that you would learn something. And in this case, it was so that really they would learn to, to trust in God more, that they would appreciate that they, you know, they lived by the, the loving kindness of, of God from day to day. Um, it was to help them to, uh, to put their own lives, I guess, in, in better perspective. And that, and that process of learning to, to, uh, to trust God and, and the things that he either allows or brings into our lives by way of suffering, is that something that's still true for, uh, for Christians today, um, as, it, as it was true for the Israelites three and a half thousand years ago? Um, I'm going to look at another Old Testament passage. This is back in Proverbs again. I said he had a lot to say it's about It's your favourite, isn't it? It's your favourite. Uh, it is tonight. Uh, this one's Proverbs 3, and, um, and the writer there in Proverbs, this is, uh, this is Solomon writing and thinking again about the, the occasions of suffering we might go through in life, and the fact they may well come from God, says in Proverbs 3 and verse 11, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son, in whom he delights. And, uh, and that's in making this really important point, isn't it? That, that sometimes the things we suffer in life really are a, a sign of, of God's love for us, that, that he is, he's like, well, it says he's like, he's like a father, he's like a loving parent who knows um, painful though it is, that, that discipline is needed in the life of a child to help them to go in the, uh, in, in the right direction in life. And that is those verses actually which are, are picked up in the New Testament when the writer of the letter to the Hebrews, if you want to turn to it, it's in Hebrews chapter 12, writer uh, to, of the letter to the Hebrews, he expands on, on this uh, and says, okay, well this is, this is the, the message uh, that suffering brings for the for the follower of Jesus Christ today, you know, because I suppose these these um, these Jewish Christians he was writing to may well have felt that as Christians they shouldn't be suffering. You know, why why is it happening in my life? And uh, and he says in verse five of Hebrews twelve, he says, "You've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to us to sons." And then he quotes Proverbs: "My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him." For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we might may be partakers of his holiness. 
Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And, and he's expanding there, isn't he, the writer, on this idea that, that suffering really is a, a sign of, of God's love for, for you and me. It's, it's him helping us to find the right way in life. And, and actually, he's saying here that chastening, um, in whatever form it takes for you and me, is actually for our eternal benefit. This is God trying to get us to the ultimate best place that we can possibly be uh, in life. And uh, one, last, one last one for you is, is really my, my favourite verse uh, in the Bible, and it isn't in Proverbs, and it's, uh, and it's one in, in Romans, where Paul, when he writes to the Romans, says that we know, this is we who are followers of Jesus, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. All things, he says, work together for good. And that, that's the bad things, the suffering that we go through, as well as the, uh, the good and the blessings that we receive in life. And very often, of course, it's only maybe years later in retrospect that we can look back and say, well, actually, I hated that at the time. I can now see how it might have been the best thing that happened to me. I mean, it's yeah. not always that easy to see that. Uh, but but it, it can it, you know we can get that perspective looking back very often. Definitely, it, was, it reminds me of my uh, violin practice when I was uh, a young lad. That is suffering. It may be, uh, <laughs> suffering. Maybe suffering. was suffering for <laughs> the household. <laughs> <laughs> maybe still is. So, but there is that idea, isn't there, that, that comes out in scripture of of a of uh, the character being shaped, the uh, a stone being created. There's that idea, isn't there, of a temple being built and us being stones and. A, and needing to be chiselled away and and, yeah. and and created and so and that process is painful um, so you have the situation right at the beginning in Genesis where um, they fail to show the glory of God and from that point forward we're being shaped into characters which are hopefully more aligned with the character yeah. of his son Jesus and, and God so there's this idea that comes through and Proverbs again is, is, is wonderful because you have you know, these choices that are being laid out, follow wisdom or don't. Yeah. So there's this idea of the scriptures shaping the way you do it. And so that, yeah. that shaping so. Comes, comes through scripture. So um, often when we think of suffering, we link it um, directly to another thing that we find in scripture a lot about, and, and, and um, spoken a lot about, uh, is prayer. And even culturally, you know, you'll think, you know, when do you say a prayer? You say a prayer when you're in trouble, or when there's, you know, you're up, you know, your back's against the wall, or you're in dire need, and and and, and you will say a prayer to to your God. Mm. Um, um, but what what does what does um, what does scripture or, or examples do you find of of that um, that link between uh, that comfort that we get from from prayer and and suffering? I think um, I'll, I'll probably share with you uh, one one example because one of the one of the ways in, in which uh, God is described in, in Scripture is, uh, is being the, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And that's a description that the Apostle Paul uses. Um, if you want to look at it, it's in, in 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. And, um, and, and Paul's writing here at this point, he's writing about some awful suffering which, which he and, and his companions have been through. Um, during uh, a spell of time that they, they'd had in Turkey. Um, and just, just pick it up, uh, saying 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3. Um, and, and in many ways, this is almost a, a prayer of thanks he's offering. But he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation." that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of, of God. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's, it's clear as you read through 2 Corinthians, apart from the fact that they'd obviously really been through the, uh, the ringer, that, that Paul is able, to, is able to reflect back on the fact that although they, they thought at one point they were going to die, um, that, that through their prayers and the prayers of others, 
God had clearly not abandoned them. He'd not left them to their suffering and to, uh, to die. He, but he'd answered the prayer and, and he'd delivered them. And you can see it actually as you go through this chapter down at, say, verse 9. Um, I mean, actually pick it up at verse 8. He says, we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. That, that's Turkey. Uh, he says that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. And, and you know, you can see that there have been a lot of prayer made that, that he references again in, in the letter, and, and it had brought... Um, deliverance from from what had been obviously been quite severe suffering and 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 Paul's able to say now well you know we've received comfort from that from God you know him hearing us in in a time of trouble and 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 saving us out of of, of our trouble now we can we can comfort others that's what he said earlier mm. on wasn't it you know yeah. he, he God comforts us we can now provide comfort to anybody else who's in tribulation because we've been through this and we've and we've come out the other side and there's, a, there's another lovely thing that Paul says back in, in 1 Corinthians when, when he says that, Paul, that God doesn't test us beyond our, our ability to endure. Um, that God always makes a way for us to be able to bear our sufferings. Now that, again, that, when you're going through it, you know, that can be very difficult to accept. But it's, it's Paul actually saying that, that if we can... We, we need to be able to, to sort of lean on God, uh, which we do, do, you know, do through prayer and through, through reading his word and, and trust that, that actually God knows us better than we know ourselves mm. and that he will never push us beyond, beyond what we can actually, actually bear. Yeah, that's a lovely thought. And, and maybe we can just summarise maybe where we've got to so far and then, and then just have one, one final thought. So... Um, we've obviously looked at the origins of suffering. We've seen that that stems from, from Genesis and, that, and that's, that, um, that state of mankind has permeated through the generations and we experience it today. Um, we see, don't we, that uh, we are given and presented with free will so we can make choices in our life. And as obviously there's two results of that. You can choose righteousness or you can choose evil and, that, and there's implications um, of both. Um, and also, as, as Bible believers, we, we see that, um, that Scripture doesn't just, you know, belief in Jesus doesn't immediately take away pain and suffering. Instead, it's a way of sh shaping and strengthening us today mm -hmm. for, for, for some, some, something in the future. And that, that's really what I want to come to, because you hinted a couple of times about like, shaping for the future. And just, just that verse that you quoted from Luke... Uh, where you talked about the Tower, Tower of Siloam. And Jesus, he drops a little hint, doesn't he, in that uh, fifth verse, and he says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Mm -hmm. And hidden in there, well, not hidden, but in there you see, oh, wait a minute, there's something beyond that. So in this life, we are going to experience suffering. It's going to shape us, yeah. but there's something else. And then also um, the top and tail of Scripture, Revelation being the end, we start to see in Revelation, I'll just quote you a verse from Revelation um, 21, where it says that God will wipe away every tear from the eyes and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no crying. And so we, we see, don't we, the, the end of the story right away from Genesis through, through to Revelation. So maybe we can just spend a few moments on what does, what does that look like in Scripture? What does that future time that we're looking for and being shaped for look like? Okay. And uh, I, I guess there's a bit of treading on other there folks' is, yeah. toes here, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's for them to worry about next week. Um, really, the greatest message uh, that the Bible has, uh, for, after all we've been through this evening, is, um, is that suffering actually does have, it does have an end. Um, that there is a time spoken of again and again in the Bible where it says suffering is actually going to be a thing, a thing of the past. You know, that we might, we're all subject to suffering leading to death now, but that God offers to every man and woman uh, a hope of eternal life instead and a, and a change of nature from mortal mm -hmm. um, to, to immortal. And, and you know, if, if mortality is a, a corrupting mind and a, 
and a corrupting body, then it's the absolute opposite of that. Um, the Apostle Paul picks it up a little bit when he, in writing in Romans, he says, um, you know, the wages of sin is death. But he goes on to say that the, the free gift of God is eternal life mm -hmm. through, through Jesus Christ. Um, and actually, um, a, a couple of chapters later, when, it, when he's writing in Romans, um, he, he just pictures this future time uh, and, and says these words. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I, I just find that mind-blowing, particularly for a man like Paul, who when he lists all the things he'd been through, included being beaten so many times and stoned um, for, for his, his Christian faith. And, and Paul's saying that the future that lies before men and women who follow Jesus Christ is so good that we, we won't even remember the worst of sufferings we've been through. You know, they, whatever trauma they've brought in our life will, will just be, it'll be nothing. Um, and, and we see glimpses of this. You've already mentioned one from the end, very end of the Bible there in, in uh, Revelation. But I want to leave you really from me with a couple of verses from Isaiah. And it's Isaiah chapter 35. Uh, because this, this just shows you some of that future time that God promises when, when men and women who've put their trust in God won't, won't endure suffering yes. any, anymore. And you can see the reversal of, of, of the curse, if you like. Mm -hmm. you know, Isaiah 35, amongst lots of fantastic things that God promises, it, it, just verse 5 and 6 in this verse, in this chapter, um, Isaiah writes, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for water shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. And that's a lovely vision of, yeah. of suffering removed that the Bible gives to us. Great, thank you, Mark. It's a perfect way to, to end um, uh, consideration this evening. Um, looking forward to that gift, looking forward to that vision of, of the future. <coughs>